Well, good morning, everybody, and thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here, and I have to say thank you so much to Ronan because he's, uh, I feel he's warmed up the audience nicely for me. He's introduced terms like Twitter and blog, so I don't feel like I have, I'm, I'm at a uh, standing start. And also, I'm really glad that Ronan went before me, apart from the fact that uh, it's always good to be the second speaker, but I'm glad he went before me because I was jotting down some notes while he was speaking. A lot of what he was saying, I will be giving you um, a different perspective, a perspective from the patient uh, point of view. So um, I was uh, billed as a healthcare writer. I'm a healthcare writer. I'm um, also um, a blogger. I'm a patient advocate. So I'll tell you a little bit about my story as we go along. And the other thing I just want to say, I just noticed my, my notes there, just in case I forget to, to say it, is I just want to say how progressive it is, and I know that Ronan will agree with me, that you have invited a patient to speak at this. And I know that, I'm not sure how many people are familiar, I know Ronan is with um, Dr. Luciana Englund, and he has spoken very, very much about how patients do need to be at conferences like this. And he has a motto, and the motto is, nothing about me without me. So I just want to acknowledge that by inviting me here today and by allowing me to share, I'm not just speaking on my behalf, I'm speaking on behalf of all patients. So, um, well done. <laughs> okay, so, I'm Marie, I've given you a little introduction, but I've got a confession to make. I'm one of those things called a medical Googler. That's, we like to call ourselves e-patients, but we have called ourselves, uh, we have heard ourselves called medical Googlers and maybe not in quite such a um, glowing terms. Um, yeah, so we're one of those patients who come into the doctor's office um, having already pre-informed ourselves on the, in, on the internet and we've already diagnosed ourselves. But what I want to tell you today is that, somebody told me a long time ago, you should always include a picture of a cat um, in your presentation. Um, so there's the obligatory cat picture. But what I'm here to tell you is there, are, there is more to us medical Googlers than might first appear obvious. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. And um, in doing so, I'm going to share a little bit about my own story. My story began... That's the next big wave coming. I think that's probably my video from later on the... Okay, I'm not, I'm not ready yet. Um, this is the serious part. My journey begins. Um, it's nine years ago this month, just down the road from here in St. Vincent's University Hospital. Um, my journey begins with these words. You've got breast cancer. So, um, I can remember the day, I can remember the time. It's amazing how um, something like that could just burned into your brain. It was the 24th of September, it was 10 a.m. in the breast clinic, and I even remember the tie that the doctor was wearing. For some reason, it had Donald Duck all over it. So every time I see Donald Duck, I'm transported right back to that. It's amazing with patients what really sticks in their mind. So I've got breast cancer, and it came as a total shock to me. Now that's not to say that obviously breast cancer isn't going to come as a shock to everybody who hears the words, but I think for me, at the time, I was in my early 30s, I was getting on with my life, I had absolutely no inkling that I was somebody who was at risk of getting breast cancer. There was no history in my family, um, and like I said, I thought it was something that only happened to older women. So I left the breast clinic, I came clutching this book in my hand, Understanding Cancer of the Breast, thinking, I, I can't believe that this, I'm, I'm coming home with this booklet. What's this got to do with me? So in the early hours of the morning, when I couldn't sleep, I got up and I started to read. And this was one of the first pages started, that I started to read. But I couldn't stop looking at the picture of, of that older lady there, which made me think, nothing wrong, she's a lovely older lady, but made me think, what has this got to do with me? Now, there was no pictures of, at the time, this was nine years ago, there was no pictures of younger women, which made it really, really hard for me to relate to this information. And then I came to this page. And this page made my blood run cold because nobody had told me at any stage that my fertility would be affected by chemotherapy drugs. And as a younger woman, my eggs were obviously going to, uh, hopefully at that stage, much, much premenopausal. My eggs were going to be very sensitive to the chemotherapy drugs. So I sat up in bed and I went, but nobody told me this. I'm supposed to be starting chemotherapy. I need to find out information. What am I going to do? I was in a total panic, completely forgot about the rest of the book, completely bypassed, you're going to lose your hair, you're going to lose your breast, you know, completely bypassed all that. That was all I could think about. I was a young woman and I had every intention of having children. 
So I took the advice in the, the booklet. I rang the Irish Cancer Society and I, I gabbled, you know, my fertility, my fertility, and can you give me some information? Now, this is not saying anything against the Irish Cancer Society. It was nine years ago, but they had no information for me. I went back to my oncologist. He said a few things. We don't have enough research. We don't have enough stats. Come on, get on with your chemotherapy. I was left in a terrible state. I started to look, and this is my first step on my e-patient journey. I went to Dr. Google and I started to research. Again, nine years ago, I, it was my very first kind of foray into doing something like this. Now, I did know what I was looking for. I knew I needed information that was specific to young women and I knew I wanted information on fertility. So I was well able to sidestep anything that offered me miracle cures or told me I could keep my hair or anything like that. I knew, I zoned in on exactly what I was looking for. I just want to make that point because I think that's something that, that patients who are very motivated this, this thing about patients, you know, oh, God knows what they'll find on the internet. That's actually not true for a huge majority of us. We know exactly what we're looking for, and we, we go for it with laser-like focus. So I found an American website, the Young Survival Coalition. It was set up by three young women like myself, all diagnosed with breast cancer before the age of 35, and they had information on that specific to young women, and specific to lots of different aspects, not just fertility, but of course I just went straight for the fertility bit. And then I came across this website, Fertile Hope. Um, it provides reproductive information, support and hope to cancer patients and survivors whose medical treatments present the risk of infertility. Now, I was armed with all this information. Unfortunately, unfortunately for me at the time, I wasn't able to do anything with that information. Now, I have no idea why I'm smiling in this picture. <laughs> it must just be switch it on. Um, that was me just uh, about a month into my chemotherapy. I lost my hair really, really early on. And um, as I say, I know I'm smiling, but I was gritting my teeth going, I can't believe this is happening to me. I can't believe that information isn't out there. I was really, really, really sick with um, chemotherapy. So when I wasn't throwing up, I said, okay, that's it. When I finish this treatment, I am going to do something to make that information available. And that's another like e-patient moment there. So the next step on my e-patient journey was that I joined Europa Donna. Now Europa Donna, I joined Europa Donna Ireland. They are a European breast cancer advocacy organization and we work for evidence-based best practice for women across Europe diagnosed with breast cancer. And the reason I tell you this is that through Europa Donna, I've received training, I've gone to conferences, I now know things about the epidemiology of breast cancer, I know um, breast cancer biology, what clinical trials are, so I am, I am an educated patient. This is not just me, this is, there's a whole host of us out there. And here's my booklet. So the highlight for me was that, thanks to Europa Donna, in 2007 or 2008, I can't remember now, um, I got together with um, some doctors. It was, uh, I don't know if anybody knows these doctors, Dr. Jill Gormley, um, Dr. Declan Keane, who was in the Rotunda, the Harry unit at the time, and um, somebody else whose name has just gone out of my head there. So we got together and um, brought this booklet together. The booklet <clears throat> explains exactly what happens to a patient when they're undergoing chemotherapy. Okay, our options at the time were quite limited in Ireland to what we could do reproductively. But you know what? Having that information, just having that information makes you feel like you've got some control. Being denied that information, that causes an awful lot of frustration. And we talk about the cancer survivorship experience. This is something that's, that's very, um, very topical at the moment, um, with more and more people surviving cancer. So we need to make sure that those who are surviving cancer go on to live a full life, and a life that, um, that so they don't want to go on to live a life frustrated, and, and if only I had taken this option. So information is powerful. And there we are at the launch. There's some faces that aren't so familiar anymore. Um, so once I had done the booklet, I thought, okay, I've done my bit, now I can get on with my life. But it didn't actually work out like that for me. I, I mentioned the cancer survivorship experience, and partly for myself, um, I think I probably put aside how I was feeling going through cancer because I was so focused on this one thing. Once I got the booklet done, a whole host of other feelings um, kind of flooded, flooded me. So part of the way that I coped was, again, I reached out through the internet, and I set up this site. It's called Journeying Beyond Breast Cancer. 
And it was to talk about things like, you know, there's a high incidence of depression in um, cancer survivors. There's a lot of issues that don't get spoken about enough. This is another aspect of the e-patient uh, experience. Um, Ronan mentioned that he blogs, he's a, um, a physician blogger, I'm an e-patient blogger. Um, I'm so glad that Ronan mentioned Twitter, I don't need to explain it. Um, Ronan, I was very disappointed that you, you said that it was just pay, um, doctors that you had in your Twitter connections, because Ronan is very good at connecting with patients as well. So um, through Twitter, I'm connected with um, medical journalists, with uh, clinical research sites, university institutes, oncologists. And last year, I set up um, a, the, uh, Europe's first breast cancer Twitter chat, which is um, hashtag, for those who are familiar with it, BCCEU. And we invite leading um, breast cancer specialists, or we have um, psychological aspects or emotional aspects, um, the latest in clinical research trials. So they come on for an hour once a month, and they talk, use that hashtag, and we invite healthcare professionals, we invite patients, so it's, it's um, a Twitter chat. And so my journey continues. This is my montage. Um, and this is not to blow my own trumpet, it's just to show you that I have, I'm really, really passionate about this. I've spoken about this at uh, various different conferences. I write for, um, about the e-patient experience. And I guess the reason I'm telling you this is to show you that I'm, I'm just a patient, just a patient, but I am somebody who was diagnosed with an illness and who moved heaven and earth to find out what was relevant to me using my skills. So I've moved from being a passive patient, I suppose for want of a better word, to becoming an e-patient, and I'm not alone in that. I just want to say one other thing. When I first started going to breast cancer conferences, um, I was very struck when speakers would talk about patients very much in the third person. So as if there was absolutely no, no indication that they could ever be a patient, could ever get breast cancer or get any other illness. So I just want to make the point that you could be a patient, most likely, you or a loved one or a member of your family. So what I'm talking about today is relevant to everybody here. And maybe it's just a plea that patients aren't in a third person. They're part of this as well. So the rise of the e-patient, somebody who rises from being um, a passive recipient of medicine to being active, to being engaged, to being empowered. Here's a definition. E-patients represent the new breed of informed health consumers using the internet to gather information about a medical condition of particular interest to them. And the good old Wikipedia definition. So most people think that the E in e-patient stands for electronic. And yes, electronic is part of it. We do use the internet a lot. But it also means that using new technologies, we will be more enabled, we will be more empowered, and we will be more engaged in our healthcare. So they are the E's of e-patient. And this definition comes from a 2007 white paper called e-patients, how they can help us heal healthcare. And it was written um, by the, or it was partly written by the late Dr. Tom Ferguson and, and published posthumously after his death. So Dr. Ferguson wanted to encourage medical professionals to treat patients as equal partners in achieving better health outcomes. <coughs> now, I don't know if anybody knows this guy on the left. His name is Dave de Broncard. He's better known as E-Patient Dave. He's probably the most recognizable face in the E-Patient movement. And he's pictured there with his doctor, Dr. Danny Sands. And uh, he has a TED talk that's been viewed more than a quarter of a million times, translated into 25 languages. And a lot of people would know him even just outside of that, that whole e-patient area. So if you want to know more about his story, you can watch his TED talk. And then Dave, via the wonders of Twitter, has told me that I can use the next three slides from his TED talk. So this is Dave's story. In 2008, Dave was diagnosed with classic stage four, grade four renal cell carcinoma. And he was given, well, he said he started to look on the internet. The first diagnosis he had um, was maybe a couple of months. It went down and down and down. So it was a pretty bad prognosis. So Dave said that his doctor, Dr. Sands, told him he should go on a website called ACOR. It's a community of uh, patient peers. He, found, he can find support and resources. He can find things specific to the type of cancer he has. So this is what Dave says. ACOR members told me, this is an uncommon disease. You need to get to a hospital that does a lot of cases. There's no cure, but high dosage interleukin sometimes works. When it does, about half the time it's permanent, the side effects are severe, 
Don't let them give you anything else first. They may try other drug treatments or new regimens with you, but this is what you want. Now, here are four doctors in your area who do it, and Dave says, luckily, one of them is at my hospital. And I love the next bit from Dave. How amazing is that? It's the power of patient's network. Patients know what patients want to know. So Dave, I, I, I did have a slide here before which said it worked. Um, I don't like to say that because you know, we, we, we never know. I mean, we, we always live, when we have cancer, we always live with cancer. We're not cured of cancer. But he's, he's doing very, very well now. He runs the Society for Participatory Medicine, um, a movement in which network patients shift from being mere passengers to responsible drivers of their health, and, which, and in which providers encourage and value them as full partners. And in fact, his doctor, Dr. Danny Sands, was, was part of the, um, helped him set it up. So he contributes how well he's doing now to the fact that he was extremely motivated to find out about his cancer, the fact that he connected to peers on the internet, and of course the fact that the drugs were available and the medical care that he took. So it's this whole participatory movement. It was everything coming together. Now very briefly, let me introduce you to Jennifer Alstrom, pictured here with her husband Paul. In 2010, Jennifer was diagnosed with multiple myeloma. And in her own words, as a myeloma patient, I hit a tipping point. I realized that no one was going to magically cure me. My husband and I decided that we would visit our doctor and then do our homework, research open clinical trials and find one that was the most personally relevant. In doing that homework, I learned that less than 5% of myeloma patients join clinical trials and that if we ramped up our participation rate to 30% or 50%, we could make faster strides in cure discoveries. So what did Jennifer do? She set up a radio, an internet radio stage, or, um, show, M, M Patient Myeloma Radio. It's a weekly internet radio series. It interviews top myeloma researchers to learn about the latest research and crucially, why patients might want to participate. So this is an initiative, that, an, an initiative that came from a patient and an initiative that's working with the help of the healthcare professionals. Now, not everybody is going to go on to be a TED superstar, TED Talk superstar, or set up a, a, a radio show, or do you know anything, something amazing, but everybody is entitled to be equipped, empowered, engaged, and enabled with healthcare information. So how are you going to do this? And at a time when patients do still look to their healthcare providers, are you willing to lead the way? So the first step is to understand the new world of digitally enabled healthcare. And it was Ronan again who put me onto this book um, the first time we spoke. Has anybody read this book, The Creative Destruction of Medicine by Eric to Dr. Eric Topol? Yes, two people. <laughs> okay, so this is a book that's written by Dr. Eric Topol, who's a prominent cardiologist and geneticist in the US. And in it, he heralds the coming of a new era in medicine, one in which patients will be more empowered and one in which there will be um, a breakdown of traditional medical barriers and what he calls the democratization of medical information. So in other words, patients will receive the same, in, or will be able to receive pretty much the same information that physicians will be able to receive. So this will lead to more of a parity of information between doctor and patient. So I believe we're standing on the cusp of a new era. And this era is no less significant than the era that occurred when we moved from the agricultural era to the industrial era. Now, during the Industrial Revolution, industry after industry was transformed at once. This deeply impacted workers' roles, their identity, their family relationships, and indeed, communities and culture were transformed. And I believe that's what's happening now in healthcare. In a 2009 paper, Friedman et al. have said that what we're witnessing now in healthcare is nothing short of revolutionary not just in terms of technological advances, but also in terms of the shifting attitudes, expectations, behaviors, and culture. So, what's driving the healthcare revolution, and by extension, what's giving rise to the e-patient movement? There's four factors, digital, information, web 2.0, and social media. Let's start with digital. So we're moving from an analog era to a digital era, and this is having profound effect on how we receive our information. Information that was linear, that was one way, it's now interactive, it's now mobile. And if we just take a moment to look back on what's happened over the past two decades, 
If you remember, not, maybe not everybody remembers 1994, but if you remember 1994, it was the era of the Kodak film, cassette tapes, and the wonderful three-in-one stereo. But if we just fast forward two decades, the digital landscape has changed. So we're now in a digital information age. Um, this is a, a slide or a taken from Dr. Topol's book, and this is what he calls the great inflection of medicine, which is caused by that rapid acceleration of technology that if we think about back to how far we've come in two decades. So if you consider the smartphone and how it already allows for rapid transfer of information from the patient to the doctor, and here's Dr. Topol, he's demonstrating the CellScope smartphone device, which allows you to transmit images of the middle ear to help diagnose infection. And this is in the e-shirt, and it can transmit heart rate and respiratory rate over the internet. And a pill-sized camera, which can be swallowed to transmit pictures of the digestive tract. So what's this doing for patients? It's putting health back in, well not back, but it's putting health more into the hands of patients. It's making remote patient monitoring possible, so there's less need for maybe visits to the, um, to the doctor's surgery. And it's also playing a key role in preventative support care, so for wellness management and disease surveillance. So a new model of medicine is being induced by the digital era. And we have this super convergence, um, the likes of which we've never seen before, which is giving rise to new medicine. Now the second driver is information, and information is flowing in a new way. This is a cover from a BMJ, I think it is this year's BMJ, um, about how the internet is empowering patients. And this is a slide from Pew Internet and American Life Project, which shows that well, it has 77% of people are using um, a search engine to, to look up information. Um, it's actually 80% of internet users look for health information online. We probably know that stat already, that it is very, very high. The top seven researched uh, conditions online, allergies, depression, obesity, weight management, cancer, trying to quit smoking, migraine, and diabetes. The other thing is the information age is collapsing the boundary fences around previously closed information domains, such as medicine. Now, Ronan mentioned in his, in his talk before me about the sheer volume of, of um, medical citations that are out there. But a point that I'd like to make is that there are a lot of informed patients who are also able to access this information. And perhaps, you know, in certain circumstances, if you think back to ACOR, um, sometimes they're the ones who, who find that nugget of information. So just maybe being open to that a bit more. So this means that the power of patients and their freedom of choice increases. Right, the third driver of the e-patient movement and the healthcare revolution is Web 2.0. So Web 2.0 refers to websites that use technology beyond the static pages of earlier websites. And it's not so much a technological advancement as a change in how cons people are using the internet. So it's all about using media in new ways. We've moved from Web 1.0 when we started with the internet, and, and Pat mentioned something about being one of the first users of the internet. So but very much that was a broadcast one-way message system. And we've moved now to Web 2.0. Some people say we're in Web 3.0. And it's all about collaboration and co-creation. So people's expectations of how to use the internet is changing. And a fantastic example of this is social media. So social media is about interactions among people in which they create, they share, they exchange information and ideas in virtual communities and networks. But even now, um, a decade into the digital revolution, we, I still come up against people who say, oh, that's just a big massive waste of time, goodness, you know, you just, it's a total time sink. And um, I think maybe that's, if you, if you, feel like that, maybe if you just adjust it slightly, and you need to think about the internet, in, and social media in particular, about the ways that people are connecting online. And I like to use um, an analogy to share um, how I see that. So if you imagine a hive with bees buzzing all around, and it looks quite chaotic, but actually the bees are all involved in a common effort. So they're collecting pollen um, from the flowers to make honey, 
and they've got a shared interest in the survival of the community. So the point is that in the, in the hives, there's organization and purpose in what first may appear to be chaos. That's how I feel when I try to explain how, what the internet, what social media, what social networking is doing for patients. This is Dr. Ronnie Zeiger. He was the Google Health um, um, chief executive, I think. He set up a new um, initiative called Smart Patients. And he's quoted as saying that a well-functioning online patient community is a network of micro-experts. So what, we're, what we mean by that is nobody is saying that the doctors, you know, physicians, healthcare providers do not have the expert knowledge, but there is a certain amount of knowledge that patients have. And sometimes that knowledge is about things that maybe clinicians may consider secondary, such as practical coping tips or the psychological and social aspects of living with the condition. So some experienced e-patients can provide other patients with particularly helpful advice. And I like to use this example from the Six Until Me Diabetes blog, and it's of um, some beautiful brides showing how they hide their insulin pump in their wedding dress. So it's that kind of information. It's important. It's important. The psychological and the, socio, the social aspect of dealing with um, a chronic illness, is, it's important. And this is where patients are finding that information and that support and where they're being empowered. Okay, I'm going to pause for a second to take a breath, but also because I realize that there are still some people who may not be convinced about patients going on the internet. So I just want to deal with a few objections first. And the first one is, oh yeah, that's all well and good, but my patients aren't like that. They aren't asking for those things. Well, they will be. I'm, they will be. And what about all that misinformation that's on there on the internet? I mean, look, you wouldn't know what they're going to find. Not to mention those I can cure cancer, those snake oil salesmen. And even assuming that we get as far as getting reputable information, how are we going to understand that medical information? I mean, we're just patients. But some of us have gone to university. I even went to UCD myself a few years ago. Um, I learned very good research skills. And um, you know what? You would be amazed if you've been diagnosed with a life-threatening illness, how quickly you can, you can get up that steep learning curve, how quickly you can learn. So I do want to say there is a body of patients out there who do understand, who make it their business to understand the medical information. So please don't dismiss patients as not understanding medical terminology. And perhaps another plea, make it understandable. Um, there's also the point that maybe patients are going off and misdiagnosing themselves on the internet. I had great fun looking for cartoons for this. There, there seems to be a lot of them out there. This is Dr. Gunther Eisenbach. He has done a, just in, in relation to misdiagnosis, he has done a search um, which showed that there, was, there have been no deaths in th a three year search that he did in Europe. Um, sorry, I don't have the year, I should have put that up. Um, so the risk of inaccurate online information is actually, it's, 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 um, it's not as much as people think. He also noted that on an internet-based cancer support group, the error rate um, was rapidly corrected. So we're talking about very, very informed patients here. Now, these concerns around the introduction of new technology are not new. And over a century ago, there were similar objections to some radical new invention. And I'm just wondering, does anybody know what that might have been? The telephone. So there was, um, though I, did, I was doing some reading around this, and I found that there was objections. Patients won't know how to use the telephone. Patients won't want to use the telephone. If I answer, I'll be answering the telephone all day. I won't have time for inpatient um, and visits. Um, you know, telephone, no, not having it. So we've moved on from there. So perhaps we're at the same kind of stage now. But look, the fact is that people perform better when they're better informed. This is uh, Leonard Kish. He is a digital strategist. He has been quoted in Forbes magazine as saying patient engagement is the blockbuster drug of the century. And if patient engagement were a drug, it would be the blockbuster drug of the century and malpractice not to use it. Maybe some people think that's going a bit too far. But the evidence from the US has shows that more active participants in treatment decisions and self-management incur significant lower costs. They are less likely to experience a medical error or be readmitted within 30 days of discharge. 
they have better adherence to treatment, and there's a reduction in complaints and medical errors. And the latest report on this um, has been produced in these workshop proceedings by the um, IOM, and you can, you can find it online. And that, that's uh, patients, or partnering with patients to drive shared decisions, better value and care improvement. So, instead of seeing the internet and these medical Googlers as a challenge, perhaps it's time to start seeing where the opportunity lies. And maybe it's time to start steering patients to better online resources. So, you know, let's assume that patients are, 80% of patients are going to be looking up that information online. So, let's start steering patients to better online resources. Provide the information yourself. I know that Ronan does some of that on his, on his own website. Provide the information to the patient yourself. This is a book by Dr. Bertalan Mesco. Um, it's just come out. It's a primer for physicians or for healthcare professionals, how to use social media in clinical practice. And I just want to share two quotes from that. Uh, Dr. Mesco believes that it is the responsibility of doctors to know at least two to three online resources on every condition they deal with. Moreover, in the modern internet era, medical professionals should also be available, or sorry, should also be able to prescribe information for their patients. And there is a lot of great information out there. The other thing that you need to be able to do is to help manage patients' expectations in reality. So I know we have the joke about I've already diagnosed myself on the internet, but you know, we have to be realistic as well. Going back to my story about the fertility, um, the information I found, great, I found that it was relevant to the US, I couldn't do that in Ireland. So you need to be able, patients need to know that just because they read something on the internet does not mean it's going to be available in, in their hospital or in their country or with their doctor. So it's a matter of being able to help them manage and balance their expectations and reality. And again, obviously I do acknowledge that there are patients who just want doctor fix me. I don't want to know, I, have, I had a mother who was like that, um, you know, just tell, you know, I don't want to know. So, you know, that there is that aspect of it as well. So what information do patients want? They want high quality information about their disease and its management. They want it available in an easy, accessible manner, presented in a way understandable to the patient. They want to really have real life outcomes from patients like me. And they're looking for physician recommendations. So how will this impact the doctor-patient relationship, you might be wondering? In the traditional model, the physician has access to all of this. The patient has access to the physician um, only if he goes through maybe the medical secretary or, or some kind of intermediary. But the internet has turned all that upside down. So now as a patient, I have access. I've got access to doctors, um, you know, doctors who are open to collaborating with patients. I've got access to them online. I've got access to medical knowledge now um, through open source publishing. I've got access to other patients, to other specialists. So the traditional model has been turned on its head. Dr. Len Lichtenfeld, the Deputy Chief Medical Officer of the American Cancer Society, has stated that doctors are having to change the way they practice from being the sole providers of care to guiding patients and interpreting information for them. That represents a fundamental change in the way doctors and patients interact. This will create a new dynamic between healthcare providers and patients. And some people will not like this new dynamic. They may, I mean, this, I suppose, is where the internet is framed as a source of struggle between medical expertise and, and what the patient thinks. But the patient's digital life can become a useful adjunct to in-person visits. A patient who's pre-informed is more likely to ask specific and informed questions of their doctors, and they're more likely to prescribe, to comply with prescribed treatment plans. So, despite what, you know, I know that, for instance, Dr. Topol is one who says there's going to be less medical visits, there's good, the doctor's going to kind of not be needed as much. I don't agree with that. I don't think that the doctor is going to, I think the doctor is still going to have the position that the doctor has. Patients are still going to look to the doctor for advice. And I see that I'm coming down towards the end, so I don't need that. Oh, yes, okay. This is um, a little bit about what's next. And we will. That's the next big wave coming, which is embedded sensors. And that's, then we can really get into digitizing human beings. So this is a Stanford-built microchip that's put into the blood that can put the blood under continuous surveillance for whatever you want. And we're working with one, uh, with a nanosensor that's even smaller than this, smaller than a grain of sand, with a group at Caltech. But then you have the sensor 
at seeing the gene expression signature, the DNA signal, and then it talks to the cell phone, and you get a special ringtone heart attack. <laughs> or the first ringtone of the first cancer cell that's been spot in the blood. Talk about um, amazingly sensitive, and that's where this is all headed. I know you think that's crazy, but this is technically feasible now. The only question that remains is how long will the sensor last? Is it a month? Is it a year? Obviously, if you're putting in a chip in the blood, a nanochip in the blood, you'd like it to last for a long time so you don't have to keep doing this on a repetitive basis. But again, that's bringing all this together, genomics and nanotechnology and, uh, of course, the wireless sensor and the... Okay, thank you. Um, so that was uh, just, uh, that's actually a really excellent talk. If you want to see it, it's Dr. Eric Topol. It's um, The Digital Era Hits Medicine, and it was filmed at Baylor, um, Baylor College of Medicine in 2012, and it's available on YouTube. So it's a really, he talks about the genomic and wireless digital innovative technologies. So the reason I showed that is because I wanted to explain to you that the practice of medicine will shift from population level to the level of the individual, because thanks to this new technology, we'll be able to define more about who the individual is. Another thing that I just want to, to mention briefly is that we are going to see more crowdsourcing. And by crowdsourcing, I, I mean crowdsourcing of medical information. And actually, again, sorry, Ronan, I keep, I keep referring to you. But again, Ronan spoke about he crowdsourced um, a diagnosis um, using social media. Um, so crowdsourcing is about massing the resources of many to achieve a goal. And we're, we're learning that increasingly the data is present not just in labs or universities, but in everyday life. And a good example of this is from an organization called Patients Like Me. They're an online community in which patients with life-altering diseases share information about treatments and outcomes. And recently, they have produced the first instance of a social network being used to evaluate a treatment in a patient population in real time. So this was published in Nature Biotechnology in 2011, and what it dealt with was in 2008, a small Italian study was published which suggested that the drug lithium could slow the progression of ALS. In response to this, hundreds of members of the Patients Like Me social networking site, they decided, I mean, you know, they're going to try anything. They decided to try the drug and using, um, but what they did was they did it in a very controlled way. So patients like me set up an algorithm and a tool so that they could actually record what experiences they were having with lithium and how, how it was affecting the progression of their ALS. The results of that study showed that that was a very small study, the Italian study. I think there was only 16 um, participants. It was a blind study. So the results of the ALS patient-initiated um, patient uh, patient um, trial showed that the 2008 studies couldn't be replicated. I just think that's a great example of patients taking control of their data and using it. And patients want to help. So this shows that real life data collected through social networks. Now, nobody's saying this is a gold standard of research. I'm just saying this is another avenue to consider. They're a viable, speedy, and low cost option for supplementing the results of randomized control trials and supporting effective decision making, both in research and development and medical practice. OK, final thoughts. This is another great book, a book by um, Michael Nielsen called Reinventing Discovery. And I really like this quote. Often the most important revolutions aren't announced with the blare of trumpets. They occur quietly, too slowly to make the news, but fast enough that if you aren't alert, the revolution is over before you're aware it's happening. I really think that's what's happening now. And Dr. Eric Topol says that the revolution will have to come from the patients. So this is the year of patients rising, my, my friend Dave de Broncard. This is the age of the digitally enabled patient who is empowered by the internet and digital technology, who wants to be engaged as an active partner with clinicians in their healthcare. And I hope I've shown you some examples of how much patients you know, can contribute to healthcare. So please do let patients help. And thank you very much for your kind attention.